All right. So today, ultimately, we want to talk about HTML injection attacks. To do that, first, we're going to do a quick review of Monday's lecture content and the demos. I didn't get to the demos at the end of Monday's lecture. Uh, so I want to do the demos, then we'll talk about HTML injection. So last, last time, we saw HTML forms, and we saw three ways of submitting content using a form. All three of them triggered a page reload, and they create their own HTTP request, and then the response of that HTTP request is what's rendered for the page load. So, uh, and then there are three ways to submit, uh, three like default ways um, to submit with a form. The first one was using a GET request. That's going to take the information of the form, URL encode it, and send it as a query string to the server. The next way was using a POST request, which is going to do the same thing. It's going to URL encode all the information of the form that the user entered, but send it in the body of a POST request, which is what Homework 3 is all about. That's what we're shifting into, is handling POST requests. So now, instead of having just the headers of an HTTP request. Now these post requests are going to have content length, content type, just like your responses that you send to your users, and a body containing the information that we want. And with this, it's going to be a URL encoded body. And the third way we saw was also using post requests, but changing the encoding type to multi-part form data, a, a new MIME type. <clears throat> A new MIME type that's going to format this in a very different way, which we're going to see. We will talk about in depth on Friday, and I'm going to show you examples of it today. So let's get to the demos that we didn't see yesterday. And for this, I have a page, and uh, I think I want to do it this way. Uh, I have a server running. to a different page. I have a server running just so we can see the requests. Oh no, I can't make this bigger, can I? Resize, no, it's gonna be resizing the window. I think that's, that's legible, right? And let's do do view mode window. Will that make the font bigger? Oh, that is a little more clear. I want the, the font to be bigger. It's a little blurry, but we can manage, right? Is that readable? Yeah, I'm, I'm young and hip. Uh, what's up, RCCH Gaming? Uh, so let's go to this page. Let's get this going with the demo. So I have a quick, easy form. This is the one that we saw in lecture last time. And we can go to, I'll actually show off the console a little bit here. We can go to the HTML and look at this form. It's my form path, method get, this is, and everything from the slides, the same form. So I want to use this form to create requests that's going to send HTTP requests to the server. So let me just enter some basic information here oh my goodness and submit this and what I want to do I don't have anything coded to respond to this just the I'm just hitting my 404 but what I want to do is look at the uh, the server and see what we get when we get that request and this server does have web sockets and cool stuff added that we'll see later in the course so uh, we don't want to look at that stuff but we do want to look at this right here so this I'm just printing out the request as it comes in, just so we can see what this request looks like. So when we use, let me go back. So when we use method equals get, which only accepts URL encoding, when we use method equals get, we're going to get that request as a get request for the path that we specify with a query string, which has the content of the form. The keys of this query string will be the names
will be the names of the inputs. So here the input is named commenter. So when I entered my name into this input, I get in the query string a commenter key with the value of whatever I inputted into that form. Same thing here, the input of named comment, whatever I entered here in this comment input, that has a comment key and a value equal to whatever I typed into the form. And this will, I wonder if I still have this in my clipboard. This is a little dangerous, whatever's in my clipboard. Chat history, not what I wanted. Um, and it'll do all of the query string URL encoding stuff that we expect, which let me just quickly grab something. So if we have non-ASCII characters in here, they will be URL encoded. So when we do this, I'm lost with this window mode. I keep losing my thing. I gotta switch it, uh, switch it back. There it is, it's hiding behind there. So let me close that and open it back here and just do it this way. Uh, view mode, view mode, dot pinned. Uh, so now, when I URL, uh, when I add non-ASCII characters, we do get the URL encoding like we saw before. We get the plus sign for spaces and the URL, the UTF bytes, percent encoded for those non-ASCII characters. Uh, so we get all that features, all those features built into these forms, the HTML form, that element, the browser, that's going to do that stuff. Uh, that's going to do that stuff for me, uh, for us. So let's change this, and to do this, I'm not going to restart my server, and I'm not going to change this HTML on my server to motivate one big concept that's going to resonate through the entire course and throughout your entire career if you're doing web development, is the fact that your users can modify your front end. We talked about this before uh, briefly, but let's show this off a bit more and actually get some useful, uh, some useful stuff out of this, is I'm going to modify this form as a user and change the request type to post. Now, I don't have to ask permission of the server. I don't have to ask like, hey, can I change your HTML? No, that HTML is on my machine. Here I am as a client. I can just change that HTML. It's on my machine. Why can't I change it? I can do whatever I want with that HTML. So I'm going to change that HTML. Hell, if I want to change this to, uh, I don't know, person. If I want to change this to greatest comment ever. I can do that. I can change anything. If I could spell, I could do it anyway. I can change this stuff to anything I want because I'm the client. I can do whatever the hell I want with this code that you sent me with this, not code, but this HTML that you sent me. So I can change those and then I'm going to resubmit this. This time since it's a, and it's going to reload and kill my changes, but this time since it's a post request, Oh, because I went back, reload the page. Somewhere. Give it to me. Right here. So now we get a post request to my form path as the path. And now we have the same encoding. I get my names that I change. Remember, you always remember this. Your users can change anything about your front end. Anything. So this is a request that your server can receive if somebody's modifying your HTML. Uh, you might get a request that you don't expect because a client, you know, a hacker, an attacker, changed your HTML. So always be aware of that. Or your JavaScript. They can change your JavaScript. They can do whatever they want. Uh, always be aware of that. So here I get the same query string with those changes, those change names. But as the body of a post request, and now I can find content length, 73 bytes, that's going to be the length of the body. 
just like in your responses, follows the same format and a content type, which is going to tell me the type of the content. This is URL encoded. It's going to tell your server, hey, this is URL encoded, expect, uh, expect percent escaping, percent encoding uh, for bytes. And uh, and all this uh, all this good old format with the uh, equals and the ampersands. So now, when you're parsing a post request, your procedure is one: look for the blank line, or rather, one would be read the uh, read the request line. Uh, that's how you know it's a post request to begin with. If it's a post request. You're looking for this blank line, the CR, CRLF, CRLF, taking everything before that and parsing all of these headers to be able to get the information that's being sent, all of the, the headers for this request. Once you parse all the headers, you're looking for the content length, 73 bytes in this case. And then after that CRLF, CRLF, you're going to read 73 bytes of information. Once you read those 73 bytes, then you're handling that. However, the content type says, we're not going to mess with content type too much in this class. You're going to assume instead that based on the request type and path, that the user is sending the right content type that you expect. And if they're trying to break things, you know, it's for the purposes of our homework, it's fine if the server crashes on those requests. We're not looking for robustness quite yet. Um, but you can do add robustness. That's always fine to do and respond with proper error codes. Uh, maybe I should just have you do that instead of saying that. It sounds bad when I say it. Uh, check the content type. But um, but you're going to parse this based on what you expect the client to be sending. All right, so let's change this to the third and Third, final, and the way that we'll use this moving forward is adding in encoding type. Oh, no. Do I remember this off the top of my head? I have to cheat a little. Uh, I think it's ENC type, but I don't want to. Yeah, ENC type. ENC type. Uh Oops, that's not the one I want. So the default is that uh, URL encoding uh, multi-part form data. So the default is that URL encoding. So we want to change the default type. We want to override that with our own type here. And I'm going to change the encoding type to multi-part form. This is the encoding that we're going to use moving forward, primarily because it's the only one that can be used to upload images, which is what we're going to look for, which we're doing moving forward. It's the only one that can be used to upload any multimedia content, any content that's not text. You have to use multi-part form data. There's no other option. You can't, just can't do anything else. Uh, so this is the one we're gonna focus on since it's the most versatile. Uh, you can encode anything using this. And this has a very particular format. Again, we'll get into the you know, we'll talk about this format a bit more Friday and see more examples. Um, but this is what I'll say right here is everything that you'll need to know about this uh, multi-part form data. So if you want to start parsing your image uploads, you know, you're ready for it right now after this. So it'll be a post request to my form path. This is identical to the previous one that we did with the URL encoding, except now the content type is going to be multi-part form data. So now this is telling us the body of this request, which is 252 bytes of data, is encoded using multi-part form data. Uh, the letters and the numbers, oh, yeah, let me introduce that first. And then a boundary. The boundary, it's not necessarily randomized, but it's computed to be something that will never be a substring, that is not a substring in any of your data. So this is generated by the browser to ensure that it's a valid boundary to make sure that this string, if this string will never appear in your data itself. 
If it does, the browser is going to pick a different boundary. Uh, so they're somewhat randomized. Uh, they're, they're somewhat randomized, but it's not just purely random. There is a little check to say, or do, actually, if I think about it, I don't know if that's 100% sure. That looks, that has so much entropy. I don't think the browsers would leave it up to chance, though. Um, I, and I believe they are computed to not be contained in the body at all. Uh, so we have this boundary, which is going to separate the data that's sent. So here we have, and let me go back to this page. Uh, we have our commenter and comment of Jesse and Hello World sent in two separate uh, sent in two separate inputs, and I submitted them using a post request that's form encoded. I get this boundary, and that boundary is going to separate the parts of this content. So I'm going to get the commenter and comment in two separate parts of the body of the post request. So now to parse a post request that's form encoded, you're doing the same first few steps as before, reading the first line, realizing you got a post request on your hands. You're reading the content length. And then after this blank line, you're reading, in this case, 552 bytes of information. That's going to be the length of this entire body. And now you can start parsing that body based on your encoding, your content type and your encoding type. So we know we have multi-part form data. Again, you can infer from the request in the path. You can say, oh, on that path, I'm expecting form data. So I'm going to parse this as form data. Read this boundary. Check for that boundary. The boundary will have two leading dashes in front of it. So take the boundary here, add two dashes to the front of it, and split your content based on that boundary. Each split, and then there will be this trailing dash dash as well. Don't try to parse this. It's going to break stuff. Uh, so when you get your splits, parse each split as an HTTP request that does not have a request line. So you'll have any number of headers followed by a blank line, followed by the body of your data. And this time we don't need content length because you're reading until you hit the next boundary. Once you hit the next boundary, you know you're, you're ending. And the last boundary, the, the body will end with a boundary. So you can read each one of these by separating them by boundary. So each one, read the headers. For our purposes here, the header has one very useful piece of information, the name. So now instead of name, instead of this being commenter equals Jesse, we get the name in a header that has multiple pieces of data. So now the name you have to extract from here. Yeah, the blank line still slash r slash n. Uh, you read the name from here, and then the value is the body of that portion of the request. So pull out, extract the name in our cases here, and then get the information. And notice that this exclamation point, not percent encoded, This there's no percent encoding here. I believe the default encoding is going to be UTF-8 for these. Uh, nothing's ex escaped. It's just the bytes of the strings, and we can parse those strings. So if we, I guess this is worth, uh, worth doing. Let me... Get this to be a URL encoding again, or a form, uh, multi-part form. Let me grab some of these non-ASCII characters just to emphasize this point. And let's see the new request. We actually do get those UTF-8 characters on the other end. They're not escaped in any way. We just get the bytes of that string, and they're going to be UTF-8 encoded. Windows, I do not want to restart right now. Where's the go away button? Goodness. Uh, so just a quick foreshadow. I want to change one thing here. I want to change this to file. 
This is what we're going to start doing on Wednesday. All I have to do is change this type to file, and now I kind of support file uploads. At least on the front end, I support file uploads. That gives me this file picker. I'm just going to pick a random file. I can't even see what those are. I'll upload some slides. Submit this. Oh, that's going to break, isn't it? I didn't change it to... Uh, I didn't change it to uh, a post. So I'm going to get a URL encoded query string on the get request because I didn't update the form, which just gives me the file name, not what we want. If I do post, it'll do the same thing. My form path, and then we get the file name down here, URL encoded. To get to get a file upload, to get that functionality, we do have to use. I shouldn't say have to. That's so strong. We can use AJAX and JavaScript, um, but we. If we want to do it with HTML, we have to use multi-part form data. Now we change this to file. Now we upload these slides. Now we check our requests. We should see a whole bunch of this stuff. Now we actually get our file. It's going to tell us the name of the file, the name of the form input, the content type for this section of the request and then the body that's going to be the bytes of that file so this is how we actually get file uploads image uploads for homework 3 is using this multi-part form data encoding type so since you can't use the other encoding types for files it'll only send the file name it's kind of useless uh, moving forward when we want more functionality so we do have to uh, we do have to use multi-part form data encodings. And so on. You get the idea. It's a whole file. It's all kinds of information. Uh, a file that's probably going to overload my buffer. So I had to make sure this, this server that I'm running, it is from scratch. It's in Scala. And it'll handle the buffer stuff. So I actually get all that information. Uh, when we talk about buffers on Monday, I'll remove my buffering and show you how everything breaks. Uh... That, so whenever you get whenever you have a form that has a file input, your browser is going to give you this button and come up with a file dialog. That's between your browser and your OS, which is going to determine what this looks like. And I can you know navigate my whole file system and uh, and do what I need to do to get the right file uploaded. But those file pickers, the websites themselves, unless they have some custom stuff, didn't build those. They just use the HTML input of type file. Done. Browser and OS take it from there. Uh, so that is an, a combination of Opera and Windows in my case right now. So if you have Mac and Chrome, that's going to look different. But the HTML is the same. It's just an input of type file. All right, let's switch over to any questions on this, by the way. Do I want to do slides first or yeah, I'll do the slides first? Any questions on that before we shift gears a little bit? Yeah, every browser will have that functionality. It'll just look different in each one. Let's talk about injection attacks. So this is something we haven't we haven't talked about security very much yet this semester, but we will very much so moving forward. There are a lot of security concerns at this moment as of Monday. So when we're hosting static pages, we have content on the server. Users can request that content. We send them that content. 
Not a whole lot that can go wrong. Yes, there's still ways that that can be attacked. And there's actually a big attack we'll talk about. Uh, I think it's in, I think it made it to Friday's lecture where a user can access arbitrary information from your server depending on how you do your pathing and how you parse your path, pass for your request. So there are attacks, um, but they're a bit limited. Uh, there's not too much that they can break, especially not easily. It's a little harder to break a, a static page because it just doesn't have much for features. But now, starting on Homework 3, you're taking user-submitted content and hosting it on your server, which is what we want with web apps, web applications specifically, not web pages, not websites, uh, web applications or websites that are web applications or however you want to want to word it. But web applications, the way I use it is users can interact with your site. And we usually have users interacting with each other through our site where our server is acting as the liaison to allow users to communicate with each other. This is, you know, mo I shouldn't say most, but most of the popular websites out there, including Twitch, which we're watching right now. If you're watching this on YouTube, YouTube's the same. Users upload content and you consume user content. It's pretty common out there. Obviously, I don't think I have to talk anymore about that. But this is where your servers are going to be starting with homework three is you're taking user submitted content and hosting that content to all of your other users. So you might want to say, well, my users are, they're good. Like, are my users really going to attack me? Well, maybe not, but you should never trust them. You should never rely on that. Never, ever, ever trust your users. Don't just say I'm secure because my users wouldn't do that. They wouldn't they wouldn't attack my site, my little site here. Why would my users attack my site? That's silly. All I have is a a fandom site and everybody here loves the con the you know, this fandom and everything. Nobody's going to attack this site. That's ridiculous. Never ever ever fall into that trap. Never ever ever. Cuz you might think that your users are fine, and that might be true. Most of your users or possibly all of your users are going to be very trustworthy, they're not going to attack you. But guess what happens when you put a website on the internet? Who else has access to that website? Who else has access to your app? Literally everyone with an with an internet connection is the only caveat here, but everyone has access to that site. Not just your users, you might love your users and everything, but everyone has access to that, that app. Everyone can use that app including malicious attackers, people who just want to uh, destroy things, people who want to steal credit card numbers, people who want to steal private information, uh, people who just want to practice their DDoSing skills might find your site and start attacking it. Uh, you might think, well, who would attack my little old site? Um, but there are actually scanners out there that, they're, that have scripts, attackers who have scripts that will just scan random you uh, random ip addresses and send out little probes little uh tracer rounds if you will out to all kinds of random ip addresses and then once their tracer round hits something so maybe they're looking for a specific install of specific software maybe they're looking for a mysql database server that's using the default root password maybe that's what they're looking for and they have a script that just tries all these ips and looks for that vulnerability or maybe it's looking for an HTML form that has an email address and a, a, a common pattern, an email address and a, um, uh, what am I looking for? A An account creation form. And they're just hitting that with all kinds of requests. And they're not using your front end, of course. They're not going to use your front end at all. They're just going to write their custom HTTP request to attack this stuff. And as soon as they find something that, that matches the pattern of the vulnerability that their script looks for, it's going to flag the attacker. It's going to say, hey, boss, I got this. I got this site. It looks vulnerable. Then a human sits down and starts attacking you and starts prying and just seeing what they can get, seeing what they found. Yes, it's unethical. Um, is there a course that you'd be learning oh, to do all this? No, uh, I'll talk about some attacks in this class, but always in the context of preventing against them. Uh, so you might think, oh, nobody's going to attack me. Yeah, but that script doesn't care that you're a small site. It's just picking a random IP address and then attacking it, seeing what it can find. Uh, I actually had for 115 once upon a time a Q&A site 
It was like a Stack Overflow cone that I it was open source and I hosted it to have students be able to ask questions of the, myself and the TAs. And I noticed that I was getting a lot of users. And at first I was like, hey, the students are really engaged with this tool that I that I provided for them. This is great. Like I have even more people enrolled than students in the class. This is fantastic. Then, you know, a few more weeks go by, I check again. And I notice I have 10,000 users registered. And I start looking through them and they're all clearly randomly generated email addresses. And, um, and they want to make, you know, they're, you know, I assume trying to make posts, but I enabled email verification, so they couldn't actually make posts, but they were creating accounts, clearly created by a bot, and they just kept, you know, growing and growing, they kept having more and more, I actually eventually added a CAPTCHA to the registration form to make sure that they couldn't, uh, couldn't get in. Uh, I actually was talking about this in a, in a lecture once, and a student pointed out they worked for uh, an SEO organization at one point, and their profiles were public. So even though they couldn't make posts, their profiles were public and the description in all their profiles would have links to their shady websites. And then that would hit the SEO. So Google would see that they were linked from another site and then that would increase their search engine rankings. So I shut that down. I shut the whole service down just to make sure they're not leeching off of me like that. Um, but that's what they were doing was getting their SEO ranks up in that case. I assume, I I imagine if they were allowed to post, they would post all kinds of ridiculous stuff. But um, um, but that would be, but that's an attack that actually happens. Like I, because I thought the same thing, like who would attack this thing? I still did email verification stuff. But I'm like, who would attack this site? But, and there it was, there were the bots attacking my site, trying to get their page ranks up. Uh, so I, I like to blame Google for that just because it's fun blaming Google. Uh, they're big enough that uh, I can pick on them. Uh, so anyway, everyone has access. Everyone can attack you. And there are people out there that want to attack that site. Uh, maybe not purely malicious. Maybe it's just to incre increase their pay drink. And I assume it was um, an SEO organization that had clients and was doing that on behalf of their clients. You know, there's money involved, so everybody's doing whatever they can to uh, shady or not to get their uh, get their money so anyway we're handling user submitted data at this point we're taking data from users and sharing that with all other users so this gives other users an opportunity to attack each other or an attacker to come in and attack your users so now that we're handling user data what if a user, instead of typing, hello world, and hey, what's up, folks, and can you repeat that, and uh, how do I do objective three on the homework, instead of typing that kind of stuff, they decide that they're going to add a script tag with whatever JavaScript that they want to run, and they want this to be on your site. What happens when a user enters this? Well, now we're in trouble. Now things get a bit scary, and they can get creative with what they send here. Uh, one of the most effective attacks here is to add a script tag that redirects your browser to another page most likely an attack site and if that page is made to look identical to the page that users expect but and shows the login screen now they get credentials you know there's all kinds of stuff that they can do once they can inject code uh, of course they can just break the site entirely uh there's just uh, you know a lot that they can do here. Stuff that you would rather that people not be able to do. Yeah, there's uh, the NetDef... Oh, the Real Master's Guide right there. The NetDef Club. It's actually in the business school, which always... You know, that should be ours, right? But um, the business school, the UB NetDef, they have a bunch of CS students who go over there and are part of the club. Uh, they do really good stuff if you're into security. And then the 365, CC 365, Allen's course, which was mentioned. Those are the places you want to go if you're interested in more security stuff. Uh, so the users can inject this. This is obviously bad. It's all over your homework three that I say you, oh, and also you have to not allow HTML injection attacks or else it's a zero on the, the objective. So we have to protect against this um, because that attacks all of your users. 
User submits it, you're storing it on your server. Whenever somebody visits your page, you're saying, oh yeah, here's this malicious attack. Let me give this to you so your browser can render it and run this JavaScript. Bad stuff. It's all bad stuff. Luckily, there's a simple fix to this one. This attack, it's very... It absolutely decimates your site if you're vulnerable to this um, because anybody, like any of you, can take advantage of this attack pretty easily. Um, at least to break the site. To start stealing like cookies and stuff, it's a little trickier. Um, but to just inject is really simple. But it's also simple to protect against this. We're going to escape our HTML, which means replacing ampersands greater uh, less than and greater than symbols with their HTML escaped encodings. So instead of less than, we're going to replace that with ampersand LT semicolon. And now once our HTML is escaped, and specifically just these three characters, and debatably just these two characters, because how are you going to make an HTML tag without the less than and greater than signs? How are you going to write any, try to write any HTML? HTML without using less than or greater than. Uh, there is a way, I was trying to, I was researching it before lecture because I forget exactly how, but there is a way to use the ampersand to get some injection in there, so we escape that. But it's kind of convoluted. Can you do this and how? The safe way is just to escape it anyway and not have to worry about it. When you are escaping, make sure you replace the ampersand first since the escaped characters here have ampersands in them. You don't want to escape those twice. Uh, and I believe the ampersand, I believe it's something to do with the escaped characters that it's going to, that they can make it, their characters look like they're escaped, but not actually escaped. I think it's something like that. Uh, so we just replace ampersand as well and then done. With these, these are going to be rendered as those actual symbols. So ampersand LT semicolon, if you have that in your HTML, that will display as the less than symbol, but it will not be rendered as HTML. It'll be the strict character, text character, the less than symbol. It will not be rendered as HTML. And if you sanitize, we sometimes call it, but if you escape your HTML on all user inputted data, you're protected against this attack. That's it. Replace ampersands less than and greater than with their HTML escaped counterparts. Done. You could also take it one step further and escape quotes, uh, double and single quotes as well, just to make sure, uh, just in case they somehow find a way to get an HTML element, at least they can't add attributes to the element. You can go that next step. Uh, I don't think it's necessary uh, in most sites. I don't think, well, I shouldn't, shouldn't speculate. Uh, but these three characters, make sure you're escaping those three characters. So let's go back to our site where I have two th separate things. And this is how simple it can be in your code. Like, don't overthink this one. Replace, replace, replace. Make sure you do ampersand first so you're not it's replacing these again. And that's it. That's all you got to do. But the trick here, and I, I've, I shouldn't admit this, but I've made this mistake before. I had to very quickly fix, is uh, remembering. You just got to remember to do this. Uh, before you submit, I would make a habit of going through the testing procedures every time before you submit in this assign this course, which is going to say, make sure your HTML is escaped. Oh, crap, I forgot. And then, you know, make sure it's escaped. You don't want to run that risk. Uh, or going live with a, a site with this vulnerability. Uh, imagine going to your team, working for months at, on your job or even years, and saying, we got this site, we're ready to go live to users. You go live, and then five minutes after you go live, you have an HTML injection attack, and the, ser the site's crashed, or it redirects to an attack site. And Bad news. Do not forget to do this. So I have this chat set up. That does not sanitize HTML attacks. But when I refresh the page, the uh, the archived, the history is going to be escaped. So if I say uh, 
hit a button. I'm going to get a button. If I add that horizontal rule, I'm going to get that horizontal rule. If I want a button, that sends an alert. And somebody's like, ooh, a button. Well, they just got hacked. I just ran, just anybody who wants to click this button, I just ran whatever JavaScript I want in their browser, on their machine, on their device. And if I want to attach that to not a button, you can still do it. It won't work without a page reload. Oops, I, I got rid of the... I can just recreate it. I'm just doing alerts just as a proof of concept. Um, this won't render, but if you get a little tricky with the way you do things, you can actually add an image with an onload. Actually, can I just do it real quick right here? Unload. You know, it's not worth it. But the point is you can get even without page reloads, you can get JavaScript to run and uh, and really attack things. I think because the loading failed, I think I need to do on error here. Well, but you get the idea. You can run JavaScript. Once you can run JavaScript, there's a whole world of opportunity for attackers to be able to uh, to be able to attack this site. So what we need to do is escape the HTML. So the live messages here, which are actually is actually using WebSockets in this um, for this server, uh, the live does not escape HTML. But when I refresh the page, that all gets escaped, and now only the text is rendered. This is not rendered as HTML. It's only displaying the text because. I escaped that HTML. So if we look at this HTML, I need the raw. Oops, I need the the raw response. I can see that I have my escaped characters here. So this, like this open, this less than symbol for the image, that's ampersand LT semicolon, and that renders in the browser as the less than symbol. And I can see that throughout all this, the greater than, it's going to render as the greater than symbol in the browser. And I should be able to... add extra things uh, less than like if I type that in the HTML here of course I do of course it renders like that uh, that should have rendered as uh, is it less than just the way that it's you know set up it something's escaping the ampersand at some point when I did it that way but um, I knew I shouldn't have tried that I'm like it's gonna render as uh, literal text isn't it uh, so we escape those characters, and then we avoid those injection attacks.